We welcome those who are part of our webcast, who will be joining us across our territory, our nation, even our world, by the thousands. So together we form a global fellowship this afternoon as we join. But in particular, we want to welcome those who are gathered here at Atlanta Temple. And uh, we also want to recognize those uh, who are special to this moment and to this event. Uh, first of all, we want to welcome those who are part of the extended family of our new territorial leaders, Commissioners Howell, uh, who are seated right up here in the front. Will you just wave if you're a part of the Howell family? We welcome you as we honor the commissioners. We also want to honor and acknowledge former territorial leaders of the great Southern Territory, and there are some in our midst this afternoon as well. Can I ask those who have served as territorial leaders of the Southern Territory, will you stand and receive our respect and admiration? God bless each of you. We also recognize our Territorial Executive Council who have gathered from every corner of this territory, including our own cabinet members as well. And so as we honor our territorial leaders, we also want to recognize your leadership uh, throughout the 15 states of this great territory. Can I ask all of the TEC members if you would also stand and receive our appreciation, including our cabinet. Now, God's word calls us to rise, so we're going to do just that. Will you join me in standing as we sing together on our first song? Oh, church, arise. Follow me as I follow the bandmaster.
Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity for us to come together to worship you and to celebrate the installation of our new territorial leaders. We pray your blessings on them as they lead the Southern Territory. We thank you for the many gifts that you have given to us and the freedom to share our gifts to those around us. Thank you for granting us the ability to praise your name and we give you the glory in all that we do. We give thanks to you for your good and your love endures forever. In your name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Dakota. In just a moment, we're going to be hearing from some representative speakers who are going to be providing a welcome uh, on behalf of our soldiers and our officers. Uh, but we also want to certainly acknowledge those who are representing our international army. And it's a pleasure this afternoon to introduce and to present to you the International Secretary and the International Secretary for Women's Ministries for the Americas and the Caribbean, literally from pole to pole, from the tip of Canada to the southern tip of South America, representing the general and certainly being our advocate back to IHQ as well. Will you welcome with me our International Secretaries, Commissioners Merle and Dawn Heatwell. And now our Territorial Sergeant Major. Thank you very much. Commissioners Hull, welcome back to the Salvation Army USA Southern Territory. On behalf of the soldiers of this great territory, I just want to say we are anxious to reacquaint ourselves with you and to get to know you both even better than before as both leaders and friends. We eagerly, eagerly await what is in store for us as God leads you and as you lead us for the next few years. We trust you will lead us well into a closer relationship with our triune God and in our service to mankind. Leadership changes can be difficult because we have to adjust to new personalities, new perspectives, new priorities, and the new policies. On the other hand, sometimes leadership changes are necessary because they can reinvigorate us with new personalities, new perspectives, new priorities, and new policies. Whatever the future holds, we are confident this transition will be seamless, and we will follow your lead, stand with you in uncertain times, and most of all, pray in earnest for you. It's comforting to know that this is your home territory, where you served as Corps officers, on divisional staff, and at the Evangeline Booth College, you know us, and we know you. We hope that familiarity will serve you well as you continue to settle in your positions and plan for this territory's future. We look forward to serving with you again, hand in hand, as we continue on this mission of winning lost souls for Christ. It's also refreshing to know that you have served overseas, having just returned from territorial positions in the New Zealand, Fiji, and Tonga territory, and have first-hand knowledge of the Salvation Army's work outside this country. We anticipate you will draw on that experience to help us understand how we in the USA Southern Territory can better contribute elsewhere. We have always been a generous territory and have sent many on overseas missions trips, but there's always room for improvement. Well, that's a little about you and our expectations of you and why we are so honored and blessed to know that you our territorial commander and territorial president of Women's Ministries. But what about our commitment? In Romans 12, Paul outlined what it meant to be a living sacrifice, to be part of the body of Christ, and to treat others with godly love and compassion. So this is our pledge to you. We pledge to offer our bodies as living sacrifices that are holy and pleasing to God and to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can test and approve what God's will is for us. We will work with you, offering our time, talents, and treasure, committing our whole body, mind, and spirit to accomplish God's work through the Salvation Army in and near our core, around our divisions, throughout the territory, and all over the world. We pledge to form one body in Christ, with each member belonging to every other member. 
we will use the gifts the Holy Spirit has given us. If prophecy, we will prophesy according to our faith. If service, we will serve humbly and graciously. If the ability to teach, we will teach with conviction. If encouragement, we will encourage without ceasing. If leadership, we will lead diligently. And if mercy, we will show mercy cheerfully. Finally, we pledge to be devoted to one another in love, honoring others above ourselves, and to be zealous for the Lord always and serve him with spiritual fervor. We will practice hospitality by sharing generously with anyone in need. We will live in harmony with everyone, both friends and enemies, rejoicing with those who rejoice and mourning with those who mourn. We will be hopeful in joy, in, joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful <laughs> in prayer. Oh yeah, and we'll answer God's call to make radical followers of Jesus Christ who love inclusively, serve helpfully, and disciple effectively in the communities where we live. Our prayer for you is that God would comfort you with his grace and mercy, that he would guide you with his wisdom and understanding, and sustain you with his strength and perseverance. May God richly bless you both in all you endeavor to do. It is my honor this afternoon and privilege to welcome Commissioners Willis and Barbara Howell on behalf of the officers of the Southern Territory. A mentor once told me, or shared a quote with me, I should say, that character isn't inherited. One builds it daily by the way one thinks, how they act, thought by thought, action by action. And in your travels and journeys so far with multiple appointments, you've shown that your thoughts and your actions reflect the very nature of Jesus Christ. And the officers of the USA Southern Territory would like to express our gratitude for this and pray that you will continue to do this daily in your ministry that the Lord has given you. Commissioners, you both have played a vital role in the spiritual development of so many teens and young adults, some that are serving in officership positions, some that are playing in the band, some that are um, going every Sunday to worship because of the seeds that you've planted. So thank you for doing that. We also wanna thank you for loving inclusively, making us, making the young adults that you've nurtured and shepherded, making us feel like family and letting us know that we have a church home that we can go to, that people like you will love us and help with our growth and spiritual development. You've served helpfully in your communities and you're not afraid to roll up your sleeves and get your hands dirty. And we appreciate that, that you work alongside of us and work alongside of the people that you've been called to serve. You both have taken the command to disciple effectively, seriously, by studying the word and also passing it along to others. It is an honor and privilege to serve alongside you and I'm personally grateful for the mentoring, for the shepherding and the encouragement that you've given me and so many others from genuine and pastoral hearts. Today is your installation day, but God has been at work on this day long before any of us were here in this time and this place. So know that he is in complete control. Nothing catches him by surprise. So as the songwriter says, he is the source of your strength. He is the strength of your life. And if you keep your eyes upon the Lord, regardless of the storms or how fast that train is moving, he's going to be faithful to carry you through. The officers of the Southern Territory will keep you uplifted in prayer. We'll pray for your marriage. We'll pray for your family. We will pray for your ministry, and we will pray that the mission of the Salvation Army and that the message of Jesus Christ may shine in everything that you do. We love you, and you have our support, and we are looking forward to see what God is going to be doing through you in the coming years. May the Lord bless you, and may he keep you.
God is building an army, mighty warriors, strong and true. Marching boldly to battle, hear his voice and quickly do. We are an army, we're marching. 
My wife and I do not have the knowledge of the howls that most of you do in this room, but I will say that in the few short opportunities that we have had to interact with them, we have caught that they have Christ's spirit of love yeah. for you and for the world. And in fact, just the other night that we were out to dinner and we had the opportunity that Commissioner Howell prayed for our waiter and shared with him that he had been prayed for. And it was just an example of the evangelistic heart that they have to reach out and make a difference to people in our world today. And so in, from 2 Timothy chapter 4, I share these words with you. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Dear Commissioners Willis and Barbara Howell, we are here today to welcome you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to join with you as you confirm publicly your willingness to undertake new leadership responsibilities. In welcoming you, this congregation acknowledges your many years of dedicated service, given freely and willingly to God. The new appointments with which you are now entrusted are a further expression of your lifelong covenant with God. This covenant is grounded in the junior soldier's promises you made to love and obey Jesus and to tell others about him, the soldier's covenant you signed, declaring your belief in the Army's doctrines and embracing its lifestyle standards of integrity, self-discipline, and service, and the officer's covenant that has been at the heart of all you are and all you have done in the Salvation Army. With your pledge to live to win souls and make their salvation the first purpose of your life. Now, do you now embrace your new responsibilities in the spirit of your covenants already made? I now call upon you to keep these promises before you and to exercise your leadership in a manner consistent with the gospel values of righteousness and love, reflecting the servant leadership of our Lord Jesus Christ. Officers and Salvationists will look to you to set a high example of genuine spiritual experience, to bring an infectious enthusiasm, and to live a life based on scriptural truths. You will be expected to provide visionary and practical leadership that will inspire effectiveness in the proclamation of the gospel, and the discipling of believers for the building up of the army as a strong evangelical force, and in the implementation of programs to meet human need, standing for and serving the marginalized. You are required to continue to promote the purposes for which the Salvation Army was raised and to encourage those within your influence to play their part in bringing people to their only Savior, Jesus Christ. Nurture them in spiritual growth and relationship with God. Teach them the truths of the Bible reminding them of the call to holy living. May the everlasting arms of God the Father hold and protect you. May the love of Christ compel and inspire you to sacred service. May the power of the Holy Spirit strengthen and guide you daily. Commissioner Willis Howe, on behalf of the General and in the name of God, I now install you as Territorial Commander of the USA Southern Territory. Commissioner Barbara Howell, on behalf of the General and in the name of God, I now install you as the Territorial President of Women's Ministries of the USA Southern Territory. God bless you both and grant you his wisdom, grace, and peace. Let's pray together. Father God, 
Thank you for the USA Southern Territory. Thank you for officers, soldiers, adherents, employees, friends of the Army who every day are serving on the front lines. And Father, today we pray especially for the commissioners that as they step into this position of leadership, you would grant them wisdom beyond their own, that you would protect their hearts and minds from the evil one, and that the people in this congregation and across this territory will continue to love and to serve you, but also would follow um, the howls as they lead and direct this territory. So I thank you for your work here. I thank you for your work in Willis and Barbara. May God bless each one of us as we serve you in this territory. In your name we pray, amen. We'd ask you to remain in an attitude of prayer as the house take an opportunity to seal this commitment at the holiness table. During this time, the band is going to be singing a vocal number and there will be those who have been asked to come and pray alongside of the howls, but we would ask the congregation to remain seated throughout this time of sacred commitment based on their love for God.
to stand and for you to show your sign of support by responding with amen to the following. God bless your new territorial leaders. God bless the USA Southern Territory. Amen. God bless the Salvation Army. Amen. I'm going to ask the Howells to turn around and face the audience. Would you greet your new territorial leaders? if you will, just to give a personal perspective on our new territorial leaders. Some of you have been privileged to serve alongside of them, have been part perhaps of a leadership team, have sat under their ministry, or certainly have been affected by their leadership and preparation. But what we have experienced already in the short time that they've served as territorial leaders is a deep passion for souls. And I believe that you will find in decisions, in events, in activities, and points of focus that the salvation of people and their spiritual development into holiness will be top priority in this territory. We are confident that God has anointed them for this hour and are looking forward to what God has in store for each of us under their leadership. Now, will you welcome Commissioner Barbara Howell? There's no place like home. There's no place like home. I even have my good old ruby slippers to say there's no place like coming home. And what a joy it is to come back home to family. What a joy it is to come back home to this great and wonderful territory. Yes, we thoroughly enjoyed our time and our experience that we had as we served overseas. And we thank the Lord for giving us experience. But we thank more that we were able to come back home and be part of you and be part of this great Southern Territory. First of all, I just want to thank each of you for the warm welcome that you have given to each one of us in coming home. We have received so many letters, so many notes, so many emails welcoming and encouraging us back home. And I thank you for that. I thank you for the folks who have helped put this event together. I learned a long time ago as a cadet that things like this just don't happen. And it takes many people and many things to bring these things together. So I thank those folks that have done that. Our life's journey is about those people who touch our lives. And so many of you folks have touched our lives throughout our years. I will think back to our first appointment as we served at the Peachcrest Corps and being able to grow a congregation and a family together. What a special, special privilege that was. And there are folks here today that I see as I look around this congregation who were part of that journey of ours that. And we appreciate how that touched and impact our lives. We are so humbled, we are blessed, and we are honored to have this wonderful opportunity to serve you and to serve this territory. My aim, my aim as I serve this territory, it is not manliness or womanliness, but it is godliness. May I serve you through compassion, through kindness, through humility, through strength, through perseverance, wisdom, grace, and love. And then may I have the boldness to continue and to serve you in everything that I have said. It is my hope that we will do the right thing at the right time for the right reason, but 
I can only do this if I allow the Holy Spirit to fully live in me and through me and guide and direct me as I lead and as I join others as we go and serve. Sherry will have read my passage of scripture, which is Proverbs 3, 5 through 10. But in Proverbs 3, 10, it says, I want to honor God with everything I own, everything. I want to give him my best and I want to give him my first. God's power working through us, it's breathtaking. But God's potential working in us is unlimited. But more important, God's love spilling over from us, it knows no boundaries. May I link arms with you? May I become we? May we serve together? May we make a difference in this territory? May we make a difference in God's kingdom as we serve? We are the army. We are God's people. And now is the time to go, to be, and to do. God bless us as we serve together in this great Southern territory. Amen. I have the privilege this afternoon to share with you a selection of scripture on behalf of Commissioner Willis Howell. And it's from Leviticus chapter 6 and 9, and it ends with a quote from Catherine Booth. Moses and Aaron came out of the tent of meeting and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to those people. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the offering on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted with joy and fell face down. The Lord told Moses, this altar, fire, must always burn. It must never go out. If you look in Salvation Army history, there are about 4,000 people that had gathered together to witness the presentation of new Salvation Army flags for Nine Corps, and Catherine Booth shared this with them. Oh, my comrades, all we want is enough of this fire, and whole towns shall shake at our approach, and all hell be terrified at our advance. May we each keep that fire burning. I have the privilege of sharing my mother's scripture. It's taken from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 10, as she mentioned earlier. And it says this, and it's from the message. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen to God's voice in everything you do. Everywhere you go, he's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume you know it all. Run to God, run from evil. Your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. And I think that's a challenge for all of us to give him our first and our best. We are so thankful for the ministry of the Southern Territorial Band. We have been blessed, we have been inspired, we have been moved. Thank you for your faithful service to God. Now we're going to be singing a brand new arrangement uh, that has been put together by our own Nick Simmons Smith. And we uh, will be joining together to sing familiar words, all four verses of them but to a march-like tempo, something that certainly fits the spirit of the challenge within these words. So I'm going to ask that you would stand as we sing together, Rescue the Perishing. Follow along after the last verse and key change, 
The final chorus will be stretching out. Watch carefully. I asked them to do that. I like the song, but I've never really cared for the, the slow, almost apologetic feel of it. And so I want to see us rescue the perishing, care for the dying, but I don't want to apologize for it. So there we are. Thank you, Ben. Well done. Thank you, Nick. Excellent. Excellent. Now, there are some cadets who are going to help me out. Cadets, yep, come on down. Get some help here. And I'm going to grab a music stand. It just feels a little more comfortable. Mark, you know what to do. Okay, good deal. Don't get this wrong, Mark. Okay, and you can turn and face people, uh, that's fine, and just let's pull this tight a little bit. I, I owe a debt to Francis Chan. I first saw this on a video that Francis Chan did, and so I've, I've borrowed his illustration, and just, uh, you can even scoot down just a little if you would. There we are, good. And you need that little part just there, Mark. Yeah, that's the part we really want to do some initial focusing on. Uh, you see my friend the rope here. Actually, this would go on a good bit more. I've got a whole bunch of extra left over here. Here. Bob, hold this. You can do that. There we are. Good. So imagine that this rope is a, a continuum. Imagine that this rope is a timeline and that, that stretches on into forever, but not just any kind of a continuum or timeline, but that this rope is a continuum or timeline of the average person's life. Now, typically, 
we focus here. I imagine that this is our time spent on earth, but then at the end of that, we've got all of eternity stretching on forever. Now, I'm going to sort of zoom in on this. Hang on a minute, Mark. Let me just step here. Uh, let's make this a little bit bigger just so you can see. This is this. You see the similarity, don't you? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So, the way, the way this normally plays out, again, this is our time spent here on earth. And so, zooming in on what Mark has, you're born here, you die here, and life is this bit in between. For many, not everyone, but for many, it's along the lines of, yes, you're born here, you may get married, oh, say, here, and that goes for a while, and you work, and you work, and you work, and then you retire, say, here, and then retirement for a while, and then on we go. Eternity. Now, this part that Mark has that I'm just sort of zooming in on, everybody lives this, but not everybody lives this the same, do they? Let's face it, during this part, there are some people who are more what we would call successful. During this part, there are people who make more money than others. During this part of life, there are people who find themselves having more privilege than others. There are people who, during this part, live healthier lives. They somehow seem to acquire more possessions, more things, bigger houses. On and on it goes. And we call that success. During this same time, not everybody gets it that way. There are people who still, during this time on earth, they find themselves struggling with hardship. They fall into debt, deep debt. I don't mean just, I need to pay on the credit card. But they find themselves almost selling their souls. We find people during this time who, through a series of events, are gripped by addiction during this time. They always seem to struggle for one reason or another. Now, we're the army. We're the army. We believe that we have been raised up by God. Thank you. Thank you. To really affect this part of the continuum. We focus what we do so much right there on that bit. We understand that we are charged to make a positive difference here. To that end, we understand as the army that it's our duty not just to sit in rows and stare at the back of the head of the person in front of us, but rather we actively, we intentionally, we purposefully go out after people who have hurts, needs, concerns, who suffer, who ache, who grieve during this time. Each year, our territory, the U.S. Southern Territory, we serve somewhere between one and a half and two million people a year with their hurts, with their needs, with their concerns, with the various issues that find them. One, one and a half to two million people a year. Because hurt and need, it, it's not really class-based. There are people all over the spectrum who ache. People all over the spectrum who hurt. And we believe, as the army, that we kind of roll up our sleeves and want to make a difference there. But here's my question for you. We understand all that I've just explained, and okay, the continuum thing, that's kind of clever, fine, but it, it's this visual. Why do we do what we do here? We could, we could spend the rest of the afternoon explaining all the different things that we do, but why do we do what we do here? 
What's the reason behind it? What's the drive? What motivates us? Typical army answers would be something along the lines of, we're the army. We help people. We're the army. We want to ease suffering. We're the army. We want to establish a better sense of equal justice across the spectrum. We're the army. People need an advocate. Plenty of other responses along those kinds of lines. Now, as answers go, those are good answers as far as they go. But do they go far enough? Are any of these sorts of answers the ultimate why that prompts us, that drives us to do what we do? We want to help people. If this is, if this is all that motivates us, what makes us different from, say, the Red Cross or other social service agencies who want to do good and who want to ease people's suffering. What makes us different? What makes us unique? I would suggest that every one of these sorts of answers, good as they are, they stop short, importantly short, dramatically short, of addressing the greater need and ultimately stopping short of us fulfilling what we believe is the overarching mission of the army. You see, as believers, as the army, what we do here has got to be done with an eye toward how does it affect here. If we stop with this, We've stopped short of this. Heaven help us to not stop there. You see, what we need to realize is that this part is all part of the entire continuum. This is not all she wrote. It's just that part. What about all the rest that comes with it? The same thing, rather, the thing we have to remember is that it's all connected. It's all part of the same continuum. Now, here's the kicker. Don't miss this part. What we do here, what we decide here, what we believe here, choices we make here, determines what happens here. What happens there determines what happens here. Where we go at the end of this little yellowy green bit here, that's all decided by here. You see, everybody lives forever somewhere. And based on the choices we make here and here alone, this time is spent either in a very wonderful place or mm, not so much. A terrible place. It all hinges on that part. Every bit of it hangs right there. We're the army. We believe that the only way for someone to spend an eternity with God, our Heavenly Father, is to establish and enjoy a relationship with Jesus, His Son, our Savior. The one that God the Father sent to be our substitute. And that can only be made, that decision can only be made here. And the sooner, the better. Once this is done, it's done. And that's it. The world's most famous verse <laughs> says it very well. God, help me out here, Janice. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him doesn't have to perish, but have 
eternal life. Now, even though most of you know this verse and know the implications inside out, let's just go there just for a moment. Inside each of us, there is this inbred thing, this inbred desire that wants to rebel against God and His Lordship. We want our way. We stand with a clenched fist raised to heaven. We stomp our foot. And by golly, we want it our way. Now, if you want to fit into my plan, we'll talk. But me fitting into yours, that's not what we do. There is this thing about wanting to call the shots. This, this I want my way at all costs drive is what broke the relationship between God and humanity back in the garden, Adam and Eve. And from that point, this time became decidedly dark and scary. Eternity now had options. Because of the sin that was embraced there, the rest of this was ruined, or potentially ruined. And the cost of sin, the outcome of sin, the result of sin, we understand, the Bible teaches us, is death, or in the language we've been using here lately, perishing. Now, because of His infinite love, God has sent Jesus into the world to deal with the penalty of sin, so we don't have to. We don't have to perish. But unless or until someone comes, before, comes into this relationship with Jesus, then everyone is at the risk at this point, and we really don't know when that comes, but everyone is at the risk of perishing for all the rest of this time. I'm not looking to begin the discussion as to whether we believe there is a literal physical hell. Or that, you know, there, some people think there is. Others think it's a, that it's a figurative sort of thing. Uh, my own personal view is I think it's real because Jesus seemed to think it was real. And I, I just kind of go there. And certainly William Booth thought it was real, and it motivated him. But I'm not here to debate that uh, particular issue. You see, what I do know is that we are the army, and we believe that the Bible clearly describes that perishing involves endless punishment. Now, we don't know exactly what that means. No one has had to endure it and then come back and tell us about it. But, so, endless punishment. I, I don't need to know anything about it. What I do know is who would want anyone to have to experience that? Why would we want someone we know, someone we love, anyone to have to go through endless punishment? God sure doesn't. And that's why he provided a solution, a savior, a deliverer. That's why he sent Jesus. No one has to go through endless punishment for all this time. No one's got to do that. Do you remember these people here? Help me out. Remember this couple? It's a little dark. Uh, it's Jack and Rose. Are you with me? The Titanic, Jack and Rose. They're, they're having a bad day. <laughs> and oh, we've learned since the movie came out. Have you seen that there's been all these people just to figure... You know, Jack didn't have to... He probably could have fit on that little piece of drift. And sure enough, there are people who have proven that Jack didn't have to die. Jack could have lived. If only Rose would have scooted over and made some room. That's a, that's a talk for another time. But the point is, the point is that I want to make by looking at them here, what do these people need? We could argue that they need housing, that they need dry clothes, that they need food. We understand from the movie that Jack sure needs a job. And clearly they need warmth. But what's their biggest need? Someone's got to get them out of the danger that they're in. They need rescuing. They are in danger of perishing. There's no sense in talking about how they got there and really what happened to the ship. They're there. What do we do to get them out? And then let's deal with some other issues. We're the army. 
We believe that this is something of a metaphor that is the problem that all humanity faces in the spiritual sense. That humanity is adrift in this ocean of sin. People need rescuing. They need to be saved from the danger they're in. God seems to agree. You may be happy to know that. God seems to agree. Uh, in, in recent days, I've had it brought to my attention that I like using the message. And, well, yes, I do. I didn't realize as much as I do, but there it is. So let's see what the message has to say. And, and there's our words that we've just been singing. God, through the writer, says, rescue the perishing. Don't hesitate to step in and help. Jump in, throw a line, paddle out. But we heard earlier at, at the, um, at the, the uh, Croc Center, Bramwell, do something for heaven's sake. You see, this is where we get pushback, though. We find people, salvationist people, who come and say, yeah, yeah I, I get that, I understand that, but I'm not comfortable. It, it, this isn't my thing, I, I, I'm out of my area, I'm out of my depth, it's not really my gift. I find it hard to talk to people about faith or about the situation they're in. I mean, what if they ask me a hard question? I don't know what to say. I'll, I'm afraid I'll look silly. It's just easier if, if, you know, if I just don't get myself involved. Ultimately, I think, Many believers convince themselves, it, it, it's probably none of my business. I mean, I, I wish them well, but it's none of my business. Maybe that's your view. I don't know. You might find it interesting that our discomfort, our opinion about the spiritual condition of others, doesn't exactly give us and out. It doesn't give us an excuse. It doesn't give us a pass. You see, yes, I've put this verse up on the screen, or rather somebody's done it for me, but there's more to it. Here's the rest of it. If you say, hey, that's none of my business, will that get you off the hook? Someone's watching you closely, you know. Someone not impressed with weak excuses. Gang, we're the army. We don't deal in weak excuses. We accept that saving people is our business. It's our middle name, isn't it? Ever since the day in the garden when sin drove that wedge between God and humanity, God has been about the business of restoring, repairing what's been torn, what's been ripped, what's been cut. In short, God wants his family back. To that end, he is actively and intentionally seeking and saving those who are lost. Anyone who will respond to his invitation, please come home. His offer to come back, please come back. Friends, let me just make this clear. If we are not about that too, then we're really not about his work. We've got some other agenda going. If we're not about the very thing that he's about, we've got problems. There's the danger of us feeling like we can thumb our vest and pat ourselves on the back for the awards that we get, the recognition. Oh, you folks hand out food parcels in a wonderful way. During cold weather snaps like this, you help to keep people warm. Good for you, Salvation Army. And while that goes on, people slip quietly from this part to this part with no knowledge of Jesus. But we've got our reward. Oh. I'm not okay with that. I don't think I'm the only one in that boat, <laughs> hopefully. Does anyone else feel that way? 
It's a good place for an amen. <laughs> what do you say we band together? What do you say we, we resolve to do something about that in a very, very focused way here in our southern territory? Anybody up for that? A couple? One or two? Yeah. Can we do that? Anyone willing to join me in this? <laughs> yeah. We got it, Mark. You got my back, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Listen. Each of us only gets to do this part once. There's no pregame warm-up. There's no do-over. We only get to do this the one time, and you're in it now. This is it. We're the army. Let's make the difference that God has called us to make. Amen and amen. You can wrap up the rope. Thank you. Commissioner, do you think I have time for just one minute before I leave the song? If I'd asked Bill Mockaby, he would say absolutely not. But do I have your permission? I've got to tell a story about you. <clears throat> I just ran out of time. My wife and I were in Washington about a year before Willis and Barbara came to training. And he spoke at a soldier's rally that night. And on the way home, we had hardly gotten in the car when I said to her, they cannot send him to training. And she said, what are you talking about? He's wonderful. I said, no, that's just the problem. Training will ruin him. <laughs> Little did I realize that a year later, I would be the training principal when they arrived. <laughs> And I did my best, but you can see it was not successful. <laughs> You've got it backward. It was not successful that we ruined him. There you go. Apologize to me in the lobby as soon as we get out. But we are so proud of them and so thankful that God has brought them back to us. Now, this has been a sensationally planned meeting. We're the army. You know, we read William and Catherine Booth and all the old pioneers who were marching on with their flags in the open airs, and we say, that was then, but this is now. But thank you, cadets, for singing for us in contemporary style that we are still the army. And we're going to sing a song now that has been sung by Salvationists for 130 years, 1887. But it says the same thing. We're soldiers, are we? Yes. We're soldiers of the army, yes. the army of salvation. Yes. And God is sending us to save the world. Now, the busy as a bee director of the band has done another special arrangement and uh, I'm going to follow him, you follow me, and hopefully we'll all end up in the same place. We're having three verses. Each verse has an introduction. After the third verse, we will sing the chorus twice. Now, stay with me. Let us stand. Hit it, Bandmaster! <laughs>
the prayer of David in 1st Chronicles. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. Amen. Go with God.